very warm welcome to you on a rather cold evening. On behalf of the Raza Foundation and the India Habitat Center, the Foundation instituted eight annual memorial lectures named after a gay Kumar Gandhar, Habib Tanvir, V.S. Gaitonde, Mani Kaul, Daya Krishna, Gilucharan Mahapatra, and Charles Korea. This is from various different fields, masters who passed away somewhat recently, although Agay passed away quite a bit. But his centenary had fallen recently, so uh, Agay was a major figure, not only in Hindi, but also in, on the Indian literary scene. And there was a time when he was thought to be the second Rabindranath Tagore, because there was no genre in which he had not uh, worked and had attained a very high level of quality and vision. Uh, he also had a lot of impact on others. Uh, one of the most uh, influential writers who also promoted a large number of younger writers. So he was a very multifaceted personality. And we have this lecture. This is the fifth one. The first one was given by the SME's critic, Dr. Hiren Gohain, followed by the Gujarati poet critic, Sitan Shreshas Chandra, followed by K. Sachidanandan, the Malayalam poet, and Kumar Prashant, the Gandhian thinker. And today we have Alok Rai. Most of you know Alok Rai in any case. Uh, he has been an active scholar, if there are active scholars. Not the scholars who sit in tranquility and in deep meditation and once in a while come out with gems of wisdom. On the other hand, Alok Rai keeps on interfering in the scene, if you like, all the time, both as a scholar and as an important critic. He has taught in the IIT and Delhi University, and he has not gone back after retirement to Allahabad. Most people don't get, go back from Delhi. Uh, I am a bad example of that. Uh, but uh, Alok has returned to his native place, Allahabad. So we are very grateful that he came. May I greet you with a bouquet of flowers, and then <coughs> The floor is yours. And the rules of the game are that you shall speak for 45 minutes. And although memorial lectures are not supposed to have <laughs> comments or discussion, but if you would agree, you would invite comments and some questions for clarification. And those of you who keep on bubbling with a, a desire to speak, Think of the question briefly, make it sharp, witty if possible, and shoot it as soon as the lecture finishes. There you are, Alok Rai speaking on struggle for language. Thank you. Okay. Indeed, I, I, when uh, I was first called, I thought this was a mistake, so you want to call, call someone else. But to give this kind of memorial lecture in the memory of a gay is a great honor, and uh, I hope to do some justice to it. When um, Ashok Vajpayee first called me in this connection, 
I must say that I uh, agreed with an alacrity which he might well have surprised him and perhaps calls for some explanation. There is a strong personal connection that goes far back. As far as I can tell, it goes back to the time in the late 1940s when a bunch of talented young men set up a bachelor pad at 14 Hastings Road in Allahabad. And over the years, initiated many of the projects that have had a crucial influence on Hindi's emergent modernity. The journals Pratik and Kahani and the iconic collections of poetry, Taal Sabtak. Agye was a many splendid man, a man of varied gifts and interests, and so inevitably with a wide range of relationships. Indeed, um, the prime uh, exhibit I wanted to bring here, but I couldn't find it in the confusion of my home, is, <laughs> is a, a kind of one of my earliest photographs is a, of my father holding his year-old, two-year-old son, and uh, you know the photograph, which, you know, sit, sitting by the way in a basket, and uh, the, phot the photographer was a gay, as a matter of fact, but unfortunately I couldn't find it. I thought I would legitimize my claim to being here and giving this lecture on this somewhat unconventional basis. Agye was a member of the larger family circle but was also in later years a member who was somewhat aloof and perhaps even a little estranged. My father and Agye had a kind of ideological falling out in the 1950s. This was, and I've written about this, the Allahabad edition of the Cold War. But I was still pleasantly surprised to discover on my father's bookshelves a short story collection by Agye inscribed to, when I quote, Saman Dharma Amrit. I must say, I was somewhat surprised to see the inscription. And still, I have no wish to rehearse any personal history here, neither his nor mine, but merely wish to state my desire to lay those personal histories to rest and acknowledge and pay public homage to a distinguished ancestor. There is a further intellectual reason why I said yes with such unseemly haste. Agye's intellectual range extended all the way from poetry to politics, from language to ideologies, from the intimate to the civilizational. Apart from this overlap with my own range of interests at my admittedly more modest level, the rubric of the Agye lecture seemed capacious enough to allow for whatever contingencies our volatile times might throw up. After all, there's no telling what might happen next. No telling what emergencies precipitated next in the maelstrom of the more present, demanding that it be addressed obliquely, directly, urgently, ineluctably, desperately. And so my title too reflected that hedging anxiety, no matter what turns up the struggle of language, or the struggle for language, will work. The title might well sound ambitious, but as I said, all I wanted was something vague and forgiving. And the struggle for language, as a friend helpfully pointed out, enabled traffic all the way from aphasia, stroke in the midbrain, to identity politics. But intrinsic to this ambiguity, there is a matter of what prepositions one might deploy. Thus, even the struggle for language carries many implications. We struggle for language from the depths of our inarticulacy. The poet struggles for a language adequate to the elusive complexity of experience. But language itself struggles, struggles for existence amid the lies and the noisy distortions. And the struggle for language is also, simultaneously and paradoxically, a struggle against language in at least two senses. In one sense, it is the poet's struggle against the seduction of language. It is Eliot's raid on the inarticulate and the inarticulable, for which experience of the inarticulable, everyday long language, offers all kinds of plausible, rubbed-down substitutes, more or less approximate. 
The poet's struggle is in that sense a lover's struggle, a struggle to seize that which the language is able and ultimately willing. But still, and this has elements of play, of game playing in it, initially reluctant to give. Hence, with due apologies to those who might need and even demand such apology, my no doubt sexist metaphor of seduction in order to capture the poet's struggle for language. It is implicit in my metaphor that it is unclear ultimately who is seducing who whom, the poet who struggles to master the language or the language to which he ultimately succumbs. Oh, I'm pushing my luck, but I'm very conscious that I'm using gender stereotypes here, so how would the metaphor work? You know, male lover, female, whatever it is, but if we were to switch the stereotypes, so if we thought of the metaphor, rethought the metaphor in terms of a female lover and male language, just a thought. The other struggle is against the perversion of language by rampant misuse by the common traffic in imprecision and lies, in hypocrisy and mendacity. This struggle against a perversion of language is by analogy with the first which I suggested is a lover's struggle. The latter struggle I think of more as a father's struggle, or indeed a son's. Seeking to save the virtue, common as well as Greek, of language itself. This latter struggle happens crucially in the domain of politics. The metaphor, I suggest, doesn't really hold beyond the point. Thus, the struggle against the perversion of language is, of course, a struggle against the perverters, but it is also a struggle against perverted language itself, because the perverted language is a deceitful twin of the real thing. The words look similar, but mean very different things. And I think we're all familiar with current usages of this kind. So to bring it to the matter, back to the matter of prepositions, I struggled with for, which has to be supplemented with against, and of, and with, and so on. But all this linguistic nuancing reminds me of something which might be relevant here. The occasion was a conference in Bhopal in the early years of the century, i.e. in the dying years of what we now remember as the first moderate NDA government. In response to something I said at, one, at a conference in Bhopal, a doughty Sanghi intellectual declared that all my logic chopping, my linguistic pussyfooting, prepositions, postpositions, try this, try that, he said, this is all right for seminars, but come out into the real world and I will, you know the rest. <laughs> I was younger then, so I rolled up my sleeves and invited the gentleman to step outside into the real world. Now, however, I would insist that not only in intellectual contexts, but even in that putative real world, amid the senas and the bhaktas, the struggle must still be in and for language, not merely for particular language against the hate speech of the trolls, but also for language per se, for language as a mode of contention and possible resolution. But I anticipate. <sighs> the matter of literature. Poetry is my convenient shorthand for literature here. So poetry and the serious stuff of politics are often assumed to lie far apart. Literature or poetry is entertainment, escape, indulgence, merely cosmetic stuff compared with the, the real world. This distance hypothesis is replicated in the formalist cop-out of certain kinds of literary folk, for whom the real world, history, is mere noise. To remember Joyce, mere nightmare, from which the poet turns away wrapped with beauty and art. This aestheticist fastidiousness seriously misrepresents the seriousness of art, of poetry, of language. And I cannot do better here than to recall the famous Anna Akhmatova incident cited by many, including by Seamus Heaney in his Nobel lecture, 
Where waiting in the prison queue, blue with cold and hunger, the old woman turns to her, recognizes and then turns to her fellow prisoner, who happens to be the poet Anna Akhmatova, and asks her with a kind of furtive desperation for assurance that their suffering would be remembered in language adequate to its enormity. Can you write this? Is what the woman asks. Can you write this? But, and this must also be said, sometimes there is too little distance also. After all, and I'm often reminded this, of this in our India, the young Joyce, trying to awake from the importunate nightmare of Irish history, remarked, or more precisely has a character who remarks, there is too much God in Ireland. This is a very real sense in which not only do we have too many gods, we have too much God too. And this God takes many forms. Most often, of course, God is some God or other. But sometimes she is a woman, sometimes Dalit. Often he, this one is definitely male, is wrapped in the tricolor. And sometimes, dare I say it, he also wears the red of revolution. At such times, one longs for some distance to some modest ivory tower. Such excessive godliness has direct consequences for language. And I was delighted to discover a gaze, delicious admonition delivered in the context of such importunate hectoring language. And I quote, I have said that today Kavita is very bolti hai. Asal mein to mujhe yeh kehna chahiye tha ki aaj kavi itna aajik bolta hai ki kavita ki bolti band ho jati hai. <laughs> Shamsher Bahadur Singh's again famous formulation is only apparently formalist, formalist, but what he affirms is important. Baat bolegi, hum nahi. Bhed kholegi, baat hi. So, language. Is, uh, so to speak, both uh, a kind of window or a mirror into, into realities. I also like to suggest it is or can be a weapon in the struggle. The connections between literature or what becomes literature and its time are intimate and far-reaching if not necessarily benign. It has been argued persuasively that the ground for the Russian Revolution of 17 was prepared by the late 19th century masters, by Tolstoy and Dostoevsky, by Gogol and Turgenev, by Chekhov. And it is not as if all these people were revolutionaries by any means. It may even be argued that some were apolitical or even anti-political, like say Dostoevsky. But the way literature works, if and when it works, is by rendering the given present subject to narrative subversion, open to being undermined through the workings of fictional contingency and aesthetic necessity, and so deprived of its unquestioned and unquestionable legitimacy. Literature deploys the magic of language in order to persuade, to widen the circles of sympathy, enlarge the range of human beings, and so of human being. One thinks of Sharad Chand's women, of Prem Chand's peasants, of Gopinath Mahanti's forest dwellers. But it is not important not to romanticize this power, important to remain somewhat suspicious of the magic of narrative and of language. There is an entire literature of colonial glorification which casts a romantic light on its integral violence by styling it as high adventure and his civilization. Nearer home, I am particularly conscious these days of the power of the historical romances, themselves inspired by Todd's imaginative annals, that have made bullshit history and the myths of Rajput chivalry and honor the common sense of the Hindi belt. However, I mustn't digress on pain of sedition. So, back to language and the struggle for, and with, and even against. Literature is a good place to register something that is fundamental to the nature of language. This is the multivalent, polysemic, and so crucially fuzzy and ambiguous nature of language. 
tidy-minded people over the centuries have been troubled by this and sought to invent or imagine a language shorn of such ambiguity, a language in which words mean one thing and one thing only. This, they have argued, will free relationships between people, between nations, of the possibility of all misunderstanding. Great, I said. So we can shoot all the lawyers who obviously thrive on such slippages. But equally, there are skeptics who argue that it is precisely those misunderstandings, those things half understood, the slippages between utterance and intention, the no's that uh, feminists sometimes also mean yes and yes please. It is precisely those misunderstandings, I suggest, that might make relationships possible at all. Prominent among these tidy-minded people are the philosophers. Philosophers are typically embarrassed by the polysemic nature of language and seek to tame this polysemy within straight jackets of logic and rigorous definition. However, I, in my view, the post-structuralist cul-de-sac in which truth is unattainable and all that one is left with is an, is an endless chain of deferral, words leading to words leading to words is only a reductio of this embarrassment. The truth that literature, poetry, seeks and sometimes achieves is essentially different from this austere, ideally singular philosophical truth. This literary truth is the truth of experience, which is not only plural in an extrinsic sense, so as many people, so many truths, it is also complex in structure, intrinsically polymorphous, so that the poet's struggle with language and for adequate language endeavors to deploy both the precision and the ambiguity, the polysemy of language, in order to render this complex, layered, and ambivalent truth of experience. But this polysemic, multivalent nature of language lends itself to a particular kind of misuse in the political domain that deserves greater attention. One of these is a phenomenon that has been identified as dog whistle politics. So-called after dog whistles which work at frequencies that are designed to be heard at transhuman level. Frequencies. So, sorry, designed to work at transhuman frequencies they can, so they can heard, be heard only by dogs and not by human beings. The polysemic nature of language enables this kind of dog whistle politics. It enables a kind of false innocence. It enables tricky politicians, hampa chamare pachis, to remain within the confines of the law that prohibits hate speech, so judges can't hear it, but can still signal hatred and violence at dog frequencies. Of course, our legal regimes have become more liberal now, and now hatred can appear without camouflage. So, the poets concerned with language and all those who live by the dharma of language must, for my purposes here, count as poets, has implications for the larger world of politics, by, by which I mean the dispensations and dynamics of power and not the silly tribes with their colored caps and flags. This is widely recognized and I'm obviously stuck on Joyce today. <laughs> so, the task as he defined it, to forge in the smithy of my soul, the uncreated conscience of my race. So people, written, people have written about it constantly, so cleansing the instruments, sharpening the weapons, cleaning the tools. The tyrants recognize this, even if the poets sometimes don't. One thinks of Neruda, who is swiftly executed, of Akhmatova, whom I mentioned, and Mayakovsky. But then again, it is entirely typical that poets, the acolytes of language and those who live by language, should also despair of the transformative, effective power of language. And the classic instance is, of course, Hamlet's reply to Polonius, right? What are you reading, my lord? Words, words, words. 
and indeed the uh, Herbert's big new whatever Polish pronunciation or Herbert's uh, elegy of Fortinbras words ends with and that will water these words. What can they do? What can they do, Prince? But my central figure today, in order to make my argument about the struggle for language, is someone who deserves to be better known, particularly in the India that we can't quite decide the precise adjective for. So, is it fascist already? Or is it fascistic? Incidentally, word lovers shouldn't miss the resonance of that earlier ambiguity. Is it socialist? Or is it socialistic? Because we had a socialistic pattern of society, I remember. However, my central figure today, as I said, is uh, someone who I deserves to be better known, and I think Francesca has a role to play here, which she will recognize. Victor Klemperer was a professor of linguistics at the Dresden Technical University at the time that the Nazi party and the Hitler came to power, and began step by step to implement the program of institutionalized discrimination against the Jewish community, of which he had, to be fair, given ample warning in his book, Mein Kampf. I would like to note here that in the, the Hindi translation of Mein Kampf continues to be a best-selling book in India today, and is often gifted as an aspirational, inspirational text to young men on the threshold of adulthood, for what that's worth. The emperor was married to a non-Jew, an Aryan, to use the terminology of the time, and so experienced only in slow motion, as it were, the terrible destiny that was visited on Jews in Nazi Germany. Trapped in the grip of vast historical forces, unwilling and perhaps also ultimately unable to escape, he suffered the slings and arrows of fortune, the slap and the abuse, in a mundane, everyday sort of way. But the mode of resistance that he adopted was entirely characteristic and for us a very fortunate one. He kept meticulous diaries. The story of how these diaries survived is itself something of an epic because it was obviously paper was scarce, writing was dangerous, being caught was instant death. So pages of these diaries was Diaries were smuggled in cautious installments to the house of an Aryan sympathizer. And then these diaries were rescued, improbably, and reassembled in the aftermath of the fire bombing of Dresden, and finally published to great acclaim in the 1960s. And the firebombing of Dresden incidentally plays a great, great role in this story because, of course, Dresden's own, uh, sorry, uh, Klemperer's own survival is also as a consequence of the firebombing of Dresden, ironically, in that finally, so to speak, his number was come. His time was up, his number had come, and he was on the list to be transported to the concentration camp of Theresienstadt. However, before the transfer could be effected, Dresden was finally bombed. The reason why Dresden was not bombed, by the way, and this is, this is fun, the local uh, sort of gossip in Dresden was that the reason why everyone, every place else is being bombed, Dresden is not being bombed, is because the locals believe that Churchill's aunt lives in Dresden, and therefore Dresden is not being bombed. The truth of the matter, of course, is that Dresden uh, was reserved, as it was, for one of the most vicious acts of bombing, other than the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. However, one ironic consequence of the fire bombing of Dresden was that in that terrible, terrible night, that terrible, terrible firestorm, all the records were destroyed. All papers were destroyed. There were no records about who was a Jew, who was an Aryan, who is this, who is that, who is where. And as the people streamed out, of the burning city, there was no one left who was going to enforce the bureaucratic order of the Nazi regime. So these, these crowds streaming out of Dresden streamed south and eventually got to safety. So that's how Klemper himself survived. The, the diaries were reassembled, improbably enough, and they make for fascinating 
morbid and for us ominous reading. They offer a profoundly unsettling perspective on a regime whose everyday and grinding cruelty, that's for me, that's what I got from it, this everyday cruelty gets obscured paradoxically by the extreme and melodramatic nature of its best known features. Basically, there is not much that remains visible in the glare that surrounds Auschwitz and Buchenwald. What else can you see when your eyes are blinded by the glare? The Klemperer diaries offer a useful corrective to that, in that they offer a record of the everyday life of fascism. The petty harassments and humiliations that wear down people, so that by the time they are transported to the death factories, they are no longer the people they once were. Fortunately for my purpose, Klemperer's strategy in order to preserve his sanity amidst his madness was to deploy his professional expertise, professor of linguistics, to keep a diary of the language of the Third Reich. This is the title of the first of the Klemperer volumes, but it would be fair to say that even when he is not explicitly keeping a record of the emerging language of fascism, it is language that is his primary means of access to the reality of his extraordinary time. You know what I meant about the window or the mirror. Language is a medium in which we live and it is perfectly easy to be sucked into its flow, to become unaware of its currents and undercurrents, to be oblivious to the filth and pray to the creatures that are hunting in its mundane and almost innocent presence. It requires a linguist training, a professional alertness that enables Klemperer to register the novelty of Nazi language. And I quote, Establish their spirit from their language. That must yield the most general, the most infallible, the most comprehensive description. Thus I have become a philologist after all in my old age. The expressions I have collected so far are drawn only from the press and everyday language. I shall be able to begin the real work on it only when I study the books of the main authors of the movement. And I shall be able to bring myself to do that without feeling sick. Only when I have survived the whole thing, when I am no longer looking at torturers at work, but dissecting their brains." Unquote. The classic text for any reflection on the intersection between language and politics is of course Orwell's 1946 essay, Politics and the English Language. Fortunately, it's sufficiently well known to require only minimal citation. So, although Orwell also acknowledges the despair indicated above, you know, words, 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 words are only secondary, words are only a symptom, the causes are deeper, come out into the real world, etc. But Orwell insists that bad language, lying words, what he, in his phrase, was the defense of the indefensible, is often the crucial enabler of bad politics. And so the hope, he voices, that one can probably bring out some improvement by starting at the verbal end. Incidentally, this hope is not a hope that Klemperer shared. His diaries were carefully secret. They were consciously an archive for a future that he did not expect to see. So the, the first volume of the diaries is called I will bear witness. Orwell has written memorably about the prefabricated language, the dead phrases merely slotted together in a simulacrum of prose. He talks about the deep suspicion of linguistic vivacity. Yeah, all these words are all right, but come out into the real world. And the resort to euphemism and pomposity, inflated nonsense. But we need not be detained by Orwell's examples, which are specific to his 1940s context. We have enough of our own. Obviously, this kind of public lecture is not the best format for doing this kind of work. But my purpose here is the limited one of indicating a project founded after Klemperer and Orwell on the belief that being alert to language is also a kind of politics. 
and given the way in which our public space is currently being overrun, perhaps the only form of politics, I hope, that is only viable and still possible. I have written elsewhere about some of my favourites, about surgical strikes and encounters. Thus, I wrote, surgery implies a high order of skill and precision, of course, so no butchers, these dear surgeons. But it also invokes the rhetoric of health. Surgery restores the organism to a state of health. So one can understand the investment in defending the metaphor. However, one can't help saying, I can't help saying certainly, if the targeted disease, i.e. intrusion, infiltration, bad, uh, Pakistani things persist, isn't it reasonable to conclude that the surgeon wasn't very good? Encounter, as it happens, has already passed into ordinary usage as a verb. Certainly in the Hindi belt, I know. To counter, it's not encounter, counter, counter karmal. So, to counter is to kill with state immunity. Their lordships, by the way, should protest. They should. But language has a way, and it has a wayward independence. But perhaps the first word I should flag in our context is uh, controversial. You know some sort of word, but very dangerous now. Given the number of diverse identities that exist only by virtue of being routinely offended, and the various kinds of laws that offer these routinely offended identities legal recognition, we have already become, and the phrase is someone else's, a republic of hurt sentiments. And the only way in which one may ensure one's safety in this republic is by being very boring. Controversial is bad, boring, good. An elaborate legal machinery has been assembled to police this republic. Articles 124, 153, 295. And as a necessary complement to this formidable legal apparatus, there are the short order armies of the plentifully unemployed who can be mobilized to produce the disorder that kickstarts the legal machinery. So apprehension of disorder and so on. Then again, it was amusing to see the way in which a first perfectly commonplace expression was suddenly all over our papers. So, Expressions of outrage over the killings of outspoken journalists and rationalists, Kabulkar, Mansare, Gauri, Lankesh, were derided as, uh, expressions of outrage were derided as manufactured. Now, I would have thought in the context of Make in India, manufactured might have been a good thing. But some kinds of Make in India are bad. But perhaps the Honorable Finance Minister was merely signaling when he used the word manufactured in this loaded way, that he had read a book, or at least heard of Chomsky's manufacturing consent. Speaking of which or whom, one notices the plague of honor that is sweeping the land. Even as we are sinking ever deeper into dishonor, there is an insistence on the ritual affirmation of honor, not only in respect of judges, but also of ministers and lesser politicians, for they are all, all honorable men. Entire communities are so burdened by their honor that only murder and the threat of murder can enable them to survive. Likewise, we are drowning in martyrs. Martyrdom awaits anyone who dons uniform in the service of an inept, clueless state, whether it be in Kashmir or the Northeast or in the forests of Central India. Though someone like me might well, might well wish that it were a smarter state, and there were fewer martyrs. But perhaps I would be well advised to stick to something that is not controversial. So I propose to take up as an illustration of my project, which is the struggle for language, which is also a struggle against language, but is in the first instance a project of becoming alert to the ways in which language is formed and deformed in the stresses of the present. I intend to take up a ubiquitous and innocent seeming phrase, which is all around us, Team India. What is at stake in this expression as against, say, the Indian team? 
The Latin is specific and can only refer to the particular players who are part of the squad. But Team India is inclusive and we are all willy-nilly a part of it. Merely by calling it Team India, as lots of people do, I make myself a part of it and partake of its victories, etc. We are winning, we say. However, just as simply by refusing to use the expression Team India, one locates oneself outside the proffered identity. In case anyone is seduced by the apparent innocence of this, it's only a game, people can share in the victory, why deny people their small triumphs? Makes them feel good. Remember the children in Burhanpur who were booked for bursting crackers in celebration of Pakistan's victory over India in the Champions Cup. Booked, incidentally, on the charge of sedition. Obviously, Team India has a lot riding on that silly cup. Though, speaking for myself, I wanted both sides to lose. It's not possible, but I wanted both sides to lose simply because I think nationalism is doing terrible things on both sides of the border. So, if possible, both should lose. But the Jammu Bar Council threatened to expel a member because he posted a Facebook message saying that the Pakistan's victory was the real surgical strike. The challenge, once again, was anti-national. Being part of a team automatically impl implicates one in a contestatory identity. And Team India in a contestatory nationalism. So nationalism as distinguished in Orwell's sense from patriotism, which is love of a place rather than I am better than you. Thus, being an Indian is not the same thing as being a part of Team India. Although retrospectively a situation is being sought to be created in which the only way of being an Indian is to be a part of Team India. Team India encodes the nationalistic assumption that India itself is a team, i.e. Const it constitutes one integral unit which with always already harmonious complementarities. So team, you know batsman, bowler, wicketkeeper, opener, spinner, and so on. This rather than the idea that it is a nation with its diversities and its inevitable disharmonies, discords even, which is why we have a constitution and a legal system. Compare the team ideological strategy with the family ideological strategy. The latter is the more, sorry for the pun, familiar strategy. So we are all one stock really and for all our disagreements basically we rub together, you know as in Bombay melodramas, we are all one stock and for all the quarrels and the, and the, and the angry speeches we come together finally in happy and musical harmony, right, as at the end of movies. Team is in a sense looser, there is no insistence on common, common stock or origins, only an insistence on common goals. Any implication of common stock or origins would in any case be problematic in a society as obsessed with caste boundaries and caste taboos as ours. So we can't be a family, we can be a team. By deploying the team metaphor, diversities are insidiously and also forcefully and forcibly complementarized by the shared commitment to a common goal. In this way, I suggest, Team India is only the thin end of the wedge of the team model of nationalism. And of course, even those children in Burhanpur know that you can't have a team without a captain. And when the captain commands, demands your land, your money, or your rights, only a bad team player would demur. Selling this nationalism via cricket in India is seductive, but it is also brilliant. So Tendulkar is a Bharat Ratna and better deserved than many others, God knows. But why is making fun of Tendulkar's squeaky voice a seditious act? <coughs> okay, there are some other questions that I would like to flag in the context of this exploration of the analogical relationship between a historical conjuncture and its attendant 
correspondent language. One, does this kind of dishonesty for us come more easily in English? Given India's linguistic diversity, one could spend a happy lifetime <coughs> studying comparative dishonesties. Orwell, in Politics of the English Language, talked about the attraction of Latinate language, in, for English users, for, for lying, dissembling language, because Latinate language was abstract. It was relatively distant. Now, my question I'm asking is, does English function in our semi-literate context like a kind of Latin? It's uh, unencumbered by association. One remarks, I remark in this context, the, the Gurugram phenomenon. You know, the renaming of Gurugram. So, the Sanskritic spicing of smelly old Gurugram, which at one level is merely farcical to me. Normally, this kind of symbolic politics involves little more than pots of paint, yardage for flags, taller flagpoles, bigger statues, very tall statues. But when this kind of farcical exercise takes over from the real, urgent and neglected tasks of governance, it is time to look deeper for someone like me via language. So, Gurugram was, we are told originally, Gurugram, which given the current standards of evidence, and for all I know, might well be true, though how Khattar knows, only Khattar knows. There is a linguistic term that captures this process, if true, exactly. Gurugram might be the Tadbhav form of the Tatsam Gurugram. And the corresponding Tatsama politics seeks to undo the plurality, diversity and difference. The glorious variety that has emerged in the run of time. So you get a kind of Tatsama politics and a kind of Tadbhava politics. Gurugram seeks to return to some imagined monkish moment when Aryan celibates walked the land and punished the Apsaras who tried to seduce them by, well, seducing them right back. <laughs> this Tatsama longing is our clue to a retrograde nationalism dedicated to the recovery of some prior, some already achieved nation and so fundamentally different from a future-oriented nationalism, committed to becoming a nation that addresses the needs and desires of all its members. From the perspective of this Tatsama politics, history is merely a domain of loss, a fall into the world of complication and negotiation of unsettling novelty. History must be played backwards, rewound to some desired pristine point, whether in the 10th century AD or the 10th century BC, for all I know, and then start it afresh. And it is integral to this pathology that it must believe in the existence of a past, that whole and unblemished by the taint of history lies awaiting them around some sudden corner. So, if you keep digging, under some ruins that tell of the passage of time, that bear the traces of history, the past exists. A house of culture that we might occupy, a wealth of culture that could fill up our aching emptiness. Such a belief is obviously demented, but it is its subtext of alienation and cultural vacuity that is truly frightening. The rubble of demolished monuments will hardly be able to fill up that cultural vacuum. It is a little like a curse in a fairy tale. The idiot is promised unbounded treasure buried under some monument. Unmining, unmindful of what he has, the greedy fool keeps on digging up monument after monument, heir apparent ultimately to an empire of rubble because that is all that can remain. Writing on Nazism, Steiner noted how its authoritarian goose-stepping beat had perverted the dense and thoughtful music of classical German. The Tatsama longing that is driving contemporary politics has an analogous need to stamp out the confusion of history, to replace the past with a plausible fake. 
the linguistic consequence of this kind of soundproofing in which words are used to arrest the wayward and playful rhythms of natural language and chain-ganged into parade ground drills. Many will have a painful familiarity with the correspondent poetry, the poetry that is created in this language, loud attitudinizing patriotic stuff suitable for earnest schoolboys. And I quote, Main Shankar ka vah krodhan al kar sakta jagat kshar kshar damru ki vah pralay dhani hu jisme lachta bishan sangar ranachandi ki atrupt pyaas mein durga ka un mat haas. This complex of abstract, I'm not going to tell you who it wrote it. This complex of abstract rage, abstract enemies, abstract fulfillments best expresses the historical urgency of the Savarna classes that are in flight from history. As against all this declination, I suggest, poetry must happen in a normal voice, ruminant, flexible, ironical. And yet, despite the seductive and so treacherous nature of language, I, I must think it is important to insist that the political struggle must still be a struggle for language. In the first, relatively gentle context, this is the struggle for a more sensitive, truthful language, a language that is attentive and adequate to the, to the delicate contours of our lives. I think of this as a poet's task, but it is, it is also the task of the linguist, as also that of the citizen in this time of post-truth and the rising tide of bullshit. Forgive me, bovine order. So, bless the blessed beast. It is important to insist on calling out lies, even if it is controversial to do so. But, there's yet another final sense in which the struggle must be for language. Americans are latecomers to the predicament in which we find ourselves because uh, wish for gurus that we are, we got to this point also before anyone else did. <laughs> but with the advent of Trump, Americans too have been trying to think of possible ways out and one of these, Judith Butler was speaking on the notion of resistance and spoke about how the fight was for, and I quote, the conditions of discourse. Not for the reconciliation of differences, but rather for a condition in which discourse can be possible across differences. Language is the only civilized alternative to perpetually warring over our wonderful and or maddening but certainly inescapable differences. But for language, failing language, we can all start rolling up our sleeves. Thank you. Friends, after this brilliant lecture, very well articulated, there are any comments? As I told you in the beginning, you have to be brief and sharp and witty, as the lecture was. So go ahead. First one has to shoot. That's the only courage there. <laughs> Who shall bail the cat? Well, there is one there. I have to apologize for missing the very beginning of the lecture. But I want to take you back to your fascist or fascistic and uh, actually ask if there are very many variations on that, like fascistoid. Uh, and the variations are equivocation because nobody's really 
quite clear whether a name is actually enough of a weapon against a regime. Mm -hmm. And since you're talking here about the importance of language, what is the importance of the label fascist? Okay. Uh, sorry. Um, good question, Ben. I, you know, I think the, it, basically it is partly, I suppose, it's talking to ourselves and, and alerting ourselves to the nature of the urgency that we confront. Because I speak for myself, I mean, this kind of thing, uh, I may use the word fascist or fascistic, but ultimately I, I am operating within some sort of notion of liberal immunity. That, you see, that if I really believe what I was saying, I wouldn't say it. You know, if I could tell you I would keep quiet or something like that. Exactly, in the sense that, uh, uh, for instance, language as a kind of tool of identity, I mean, Begumati uh, Zaban is also, it, it does become, I mean, it, it gets identified with the community as a matter of fact, right? As the name would suggest. So, uh, th I think it's a matter of remaining uh, open to the, the, the waywardness of language, of, of, of the fact that it is. Uh, now, but whether that's feminine, I don't know. I was, I, I, um, Lacan and all is way beyond my range. All I was using was the, was the way in which, as it were, the metaphors that we use are in some sense so loaded that uh, one has to be careful, particularly now, when one talks about the metaphor or uses the metaphor of being seduced by language of, you know, of its gender nature. So. Yeah. I'll keep it brief. Um, the quotations you used, the repetition of Joyce, the man whose face is there behind you, yeah, yeah. it brings a modernist world mm -hmm. into view that has more or less disappeared from thinking about 
literature or writing these days in the contemporary context. Are we talking about a lost world? Or uh, do you see somewhere in our world? Because the examples that you've taken from contemporary India or contemporary uh, language have had a negative uh, connotation mostly, I think, in what you've said in this hour. So if you could just say a little more about that mismatch, whether you think that there is any context of a struggle for language in the domain of writers, <coughs> uh, such as you read today or that you, you would want to point us towards in contemporary times. Am I making myself clear? No, I suppose, I, no, I'm sure you're making yourself absolutely clear. It's just that, you know, that this, uh, the, 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 I, the, 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 the struggle of poets, I mean, I have one sitting right beside me and there are others, you know, is, is precisely, you know, to, to, to remain open to the struggle for language and to find a language that is adequate to the conditions, or our conditions of existence, both at a kind of intimate level and at a larger level. But the fact of the matter is that, and I don't know, I think he can speak for himself, but my own sense of it is that the raucousness of the present is something that makes uh, certain ranges of language seem irrelevant. In some sense, it's difficult to keep one to it. That, you know, that if in fact I wanted to, and I sort of started out with, with uh, trying to discuss uh, Gay and his relationship to language, and stayed at that, I couldn't, I couldn't somehow address the needs of the present in which I find myself. So that, uh, you know, even though I do allude to uh, the, the, the poet's struggle for language, really it is the politics of language that involves me now. You know, I, I just want to add, uh, sort of ask you a very simple question. As you know, natural languages, those wayward, beautiful, um, those sort of uh, skeins of language, the natural languages are notoriously undemocratic. In so, so 90% of the world's languages are spoken by 10% of the population, whereas it's the other way around. So 10% of the world's languages are now being spoken by 90% of the population. That means that, you know, languages tend to words uh, a lack of democracy, a lack of freedom and they will be crushed. So I wanted to know if you're interested in the politics of language, how is it that you would intervene in, in order to, uh, to, uh, to sort of protect languages which, are, which fade away because of the tendencies of la tendency of languages to uh, be more and more attend towards the mass and less towards the differentiation of the language spectrum. I don't know whether I make myself clear. But. I, see, I, I mean, I, I, what, what I hear you saying, Rukmini, is that, that languages are... Uh, the, the, the threat to language... Oh, the threat, uh, sort of the, the threat to de democracy happens at different levels. So that languages... More and more languages are in danger of being wiped out by few strong languages, all right, but that is not, that is, that was not the level at which I was talking about. I was really more concerned about what is, what is happening to the crushing of, of, of diversity within languages rather than between languages. But, uh, you know, obviously the, 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 the question of uh, what happens between languages and powerful languages and less powerful languages is uh, obviously a huge subject, and do I have any, any take on that? I wish they could exist, but I can see that it's a hugely complicated question of, of, of preserving minority languages, of preserving, uh, you know, but that's not, that wasn't sort of, so to speak. Yeah, I, I missed your letter, most uh, of it, but I just think it is a, a 
parallel question to the one you were raising within language mm -hmm. and between, between languages. languages. These are not two separate questions. Mm -hmm. They are linked, and so any kind of political thought would have to uh, consider both, not just mm -hmm. the question of within language, because you could have very beautiful ranges of language within an elite language. Mm -hmm. But if it meant a wipe, wiping out of various registers, sounds, phonemes, uh, you know, sort of all sorts of rhythmic qualities, then that would mean a huge loss of, um, you know, ways of thinking through language. That's, I suppose, that's where people like you or, or for that matter, Devi with his project uh, come in, right? You know, of, of seeking to preserve languages. Though I am very ambivalent about what it means to preserve language in that way, you know, because, because a language which is preserved in a kind of embalmed fashion in a lab or in a set of records somewhere is not in, is in some sense a language which has already lost its connection with, it's no longer becoming, right? It's, it's frozen in some moment of preservation. Hi. I, I waited this long because I'm not sure that I have a question, but let's see if I, if I do. In the last few weeks, I've, I've been in India and had a series of friendly uh, competitions with Indian friends as to whether your country or my country has gone farther down the vortex into the hell of fascism, right? And uh, just before your lecture, I read this uh, column in the New York Times by Frank Bruni describing the, uh, the press secretary mm -hmm. uh, and, and sort of nostalgically wishing we had the stupid elf John Spicer back because Sarah Huckabee Sanders is something, you know, to strike horror in it. And, he, and just this few lines I'll read out. For some, some 20 minutes every afternoon, down is up, paralysis is progress, enmity is harmony, stupid is smart. Now my phone has just made it impossible for me to read the rest of that. Like, but anyway, he goes on like that. Um, and then he says, you know, the worst part of it is that we have grown used to it and we've come in order to it. So do I have a question? Maybe just a comment on that. Also maybe a question that you know, Orwell wrote about the politics of the English language so long back. Is this just the same thing over and over again? Is there something particular about our historical moment? There's the question. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I think people, people like us are professionally predisposed to think that what happens at the level of language is crucial, right? But uh, I think people like us are also, as I said, predisposed precisely to deep skepticism about, about the relevance of language or anything. I mean, I remember again one of these Polish poets who talked about how, you know, how, how we can be witty and satirical as we please, but the tyrant merely crushes us and moves on. That satire makes no difference to him. My cleverly constructed <coughs> comment is of no political avail. And yet I think we continue to do it, Orwell and everyone else downwards, because that's what we can do. That's all we can do. Alternatively, out in the real world. <laughs> Maybe the question for Akhmova was the deepest question. Can you make poetry from this? Can you make poetry from it? Agar aap samap kar rahe hain Ashok ji, to ek char pankti ki kavita Ashok ji ki agri ji ki jo hai, to inhone ball ko mere पाले में ढाला था मुझे मैंने इसलिए जिक्र किया था तो अग्नि जी की दो एक छोटी कविता भाषा के बारे में मेरे ख्याल में जो इतने लोग हैं तो उनके लिए थोड़ी प्रासंगिक भी होगी तो अग्नि की बात चलिए आपने भी जिक्र छेड़ा उनकी एक कविता है मैं सच लिखता हूँ लिख लिख कर सब झूठा करता जाता हूँ क्योंकि कवि कवि का जो स्ट्रगल इसकी आप बात की तो उन्होंने तो हमेशा ही कहा कि शब्द मेरे पास में है नहीं तो मुझको बरबस उसका ख्याल आया कि मैं सच लिखता हूँ लिखने के बाद सच फिसल जाता है सच लिखता हूँ लिख लिख कर सब झूठा करता जाता हूँ पर एक मुझे और इस प्रश्न में याद आए कि मुझे तीन दो शब्द की मैं कविता कह पाऊ एक शब्द वह जो न कभी जिब्बा पर लाऊ और दूसरा जिसे कह सकू 
कि तुम दर्द मेरे से जो ओछा पड़ता और दूसरा जिसे कह सकूं कि तू दर्द मेरे से जो ओछा पड़ता हो और तीसरा खरा धातु पर जिसको पाकर पूछूं क्या न बिना इसके भी काम चलेगा और मौन रह जाऊं मुझे तीन दो शब्द की मैं कविता कर पाऊंगा ऐसे मुझे ख्याल आया आपका बात सुनने के बाद मित्रों बहुत बहुत शुक्रिया आप लोग आए अलोक राय का बहुत शुक्रिया भाषा के बारे में आज कल लोग इस तरह से विचार नहीं करते स्वयं लेखक ही नहीं करते भाषा पर बात करने वालों को रूप वाली कह के लाछित किया जाता रहा है हिंदी में पिछले 30-35 वर्षों से और भाषा की जो दूसरी शक्तियां हैं कम से कम भारतीय चिंतन में भाषा की अनेक शक्तियां हैं हुआ हमारे यहाँ ये है कि अभिधा पर इस कदर जोर हो गया है सारा मतलब अब जो व्यंजना है वो अभिधा से ही अंतर्ध्वनित हो तो हो और जाहिर है कि अभी गुजरात के चुनाव में ये स्पष्ट हुआ कि वो तो रहा है अभिधा में लेकिन उसकी व्यंजना दूर तक जाती है हालांकि उन शब्दों में तो ऐसी कोई बात नहीं है तो ये भी एक नया भाषा का के दुरुपयोग के जो हमारे समय में बहुत सारे उदाहरण है उनमें से ये भी है पर अकेले जयशंकर प्रसाद का एक चरित्र कहीं कहता है कि भाषा से सुधारने से पहले मनुष्य को सुधार <laughs> तो खैर मनुष्य को सुधारना तो एक बहुत ही लंबा प्रोजेक्ट है और भाषा को सुधारने का प्रोजेक्ट भी कोई इतना छोटा होना नहीं है तो बहरा बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद आप सब आए अब आप जहां चाहें वहां जा सकते